Part 2. The People Accessibility begins with people. If people didn't have places to go, things to do, or people to see, then very little of what we talk about in this book would matter much at all. Since reaching goods, services, and activities clearly matter a great deal to people, then understanding where things are and how transport can be used to access them is important. While many factors impact access to such activities, we first need to understand the people themselves. This includes digging into our daily schedules, figuring out why we make the choices we do, as well as recognizing our perceptions, capabilities, and limitations. This part of the book, The People, does just that. Chapter 2. Modeling People All models are wrong, some models are useful. George Box. In the 1950s, the transport community, led by Douglas Carroll in Detroit and then Chicago, taking advantage of a new generation of mainframe computers, developed what is now referred to as the Travel Demand Model, or Urban Transportation Planning Model, or the Four-Step Model, Trip Generation, Trip Distribution, Mode Split, and Traffic Assignment, as shown in Figure 2.2. The aim at the time was to develop forecasts of the behavior of people, and in particular, their future traffic. How many trips? Where are they going? How many would drive? Which routes would they use? These forecasts could be used to locate and size freeways being deployed with the upcoming interstate highway system. In one sense, it was enormously successful as the model spread from the Midwest of the United States across the globe and has been used to conduct analyses, inform, and justify projects. The early application of these models gave rise to the idea of accessibility following model or Walter Hansen's 1959 paper. It also spurred enormous methodological advances, one of which earned Daniel McFadden a Nobel Prize in economics for his work on developing random utility choice models. The models turned out to be not terribly accurate. While one can understand the naivete of early modelers in the 1950s and 1960s, who undoubtedly well understood the limitations, by the 1970s and certainly by the 2010s, the futility of accurate forecasting should have become apparent to those both within and outside the field. The forecasts are driven by the assumption that behavior in the future, given identical characteristics, will be the same as today. Culture is outside the scope of models, with good reason, but if culture matters or anything else, that is also outside the model's data there will be misses. Modelers may claim data issues or poor inputs, and those certainly matter, yet estimation of models across time is never done in practice. There are always reasons, incompatibility of surveys, time, budget, and so on. The excuse for using cross-sectional analysis in the 1950s was there was no time series. Only one survey, at most, had ever been done in any metropolitan area. The excuse today is what? In addition to behavior being static in these models, technology is as well. The use of stated preference models to examine what would happen given a new technology attempts to push the boundaries of this, but it fails to say what technologies will actually be around, which will affect demand in ways we have just to admit we cannot accurately foresee. This issue is increasingly important as new modes like shared autonomous vehicles are being considered, and autonomous vehicles, even if unshared, change the character of automobile travel. That a forecasting tool considering 30 years into the future cannot consider the possibility of such change in any reliable way suggests that it's probably not the right tool. For this reason, these travel demand forecasts, at one time the most sophisticated analyses done by humans with their early use of mainframes, fall into the same trap as much simpler forecasts, underestimating growth in the early years of a technology's life cycle and overestimated in the later years. Models might be useful for short-term analyses of minor changes, scenario analyses of alternatives, but most definitely not long-term forecasts. This requires changing evaluation procedures and government regulations. However, there are enough problems today that remain unsolved so that looking for problems 20 to 30 years down the road seems futile. The models did innovate by systematically breaking down the travel demand question into a set of components. In reality, these components are highly interconnected. In the model, they are dealt with linearly in sequence, though more advanced models may solve them iteratively with feedbacks from later stages to earlier. Similarly, from a narrative perspective, we present the text linearly, but the actual sequence in which these questions are addressed is not nearly so tidy. We begin first with trips. In what activities are travels engaging daily? The sequence of those activities matter and may affect not only travel, but the choice of activities themselves. The ability to chain trips together gains efficiencies that allow more activities to be undertaken. While the early versions of the model do not address sequence, more recent models do. The question of temporal distribution, when activities occur, arises. We begin with the idea of a schedule. 
The individual schedule has the form it does because of the need for temporal coordination and production. That gives rise to the very real problem of peaking, leading to higher travel times on the road and lower accessibility by car in the peaks. However, the peaks often see more transit service provided, thus lower waiting times and higher accessibility by public transport when it operates on its own right-of-way. The second step of the classic model, trip distribution or destination choice, examines the spatial distribution of activities, that is where they take place. We begin with the notion of the travel time budget, which suggests the amount of time available for travel is limited. There is a travel time distribution showing how many trips are of a given duration. This distribution, people's willingness to travel, due both to preferences and constraints, explains social interactions and the decline of population and employment density with distance. Spatially, that gives rise to a daily, weekly, monthly activity space over which travel behaviors occur. We can combine willingness to travel, travel time budgets, and activity space to get a three-dimensional space-time prism. After we decide where we are or can go, we can think about how to get there. We make a choice about mode of travel. This choice is highly constrained, though, and depends very much on the pattern of accessibility which explains the pattern of mode shares we see. More detail about the individual modal technologies is found later in the book. Traffic assignment, or as we would now say, route choice, is dealt with in the chapter on routing. 2.1 Stages, Trips, Journeys, and Tours No surprise, but professional and everyday language overlap in their vocabulary while not being identical in their meanings. In many fields, this is not a big problem, as the technical and professional discourse do not overlap and the general public rarely reads or hears the technical discourse, aside from students at the beginning of their training. In transport, it is a problem, as the professionals have to address the public, voters, decision makers, or survey respondents. They talk with each other continuously. As expected, transport planners and engineers have developed a detailed vocabulary to talk about movement. Unfortunately, it varies even by mode of transport. Roger's thesaurus gives the synonyms, Trip, journey, excursion, cruise, expedition, foray, jaunt, outing, run, swing, tour, travel, trek, errand, hop, junkant, peregrination, and ramble. They clearly have connotations, which makes one more suitable for certain occasions, but they can be used interchangeably for a movement from A to B and back. When observing and thinking about movements for a moment, it becomes clear that a trip will have smaller building blocks and might belong to something bigger, say a vacation. The professionals have given names and a structure to these so that they can measure and talk about them clearly. More progress can be made if the same language is understood by all parties. The key terms are stage, trip, tour, and daily schedule, with their variants in different countries and industries. A stage is the smallest unit, the movement from A to B with one mode or one vehicle of that mode, walking from home to the bus stop or flying from the first airport to the hub airport are stages. It sometimes is used synonymously with the first and last mile problem. The airline industry talks about legs and means the same thing, as do American planners when they talk about unlinked trips. In logistics, the stage with the longest distance is generally called the main hall. A sequence of stages from one activity to the next is a trip, which now requires a definition of a destination activity, as in Figure 2.3. Following the example of time use studies in sociology, the activity is defined as a meaningful interaction with another person or task. In transport, a trip is always one way, unless identified as a round trip. A sequence of trips from A via various other locations back to A form a tour, illustrated in Figure 2.4. The term journey often specifies tours starting and ending at home, although it is often used in a one-way context, for instance, the journey to work. One runs into problems if one wants to talk about tours within tours, for example, going to lunch and coming back to the workplace. Some parts of the literature refer to these as sub-tours. We also need a word to talk about the movement from home to the primary stop of the tour. You will find the word commute or half-tour to describe just this, even if the commute includes stops as such as dropping off the children at school, a quick coffee at Starbucks, and or time at the gym before arriving at work. Commute is often reserved for just the trip from home to work and back, though. More generally, a chain refers to any sequence of trips, such as from home to restaurant to movies. The daily schedule includes all the tours undertaken between getting up and going to bed again. A discussion about mode choice should always refer to the element talked about. Walking stages will always be part of a trip to reach the vehicles. Walking will therefore always have the highest mode share among the stages, but not of the distance traveled. 
At higher levels, planners have to decide which mode they allocate to the trip or tour. Normally, they choose the mode of the stage with the longest distance. In this process, the other stages are forgotten and often their distance allocated to the main mode. The chances for confusion are endless, unless this is made clear. Each trip has two trip ends, the origin and destination. Confusingly, the Institute of Transportation Engineers in their Trip Generation Handbook computes trip generation at each trip end based on land use patterns, so if you simply add up the numbers of trips generated across all land uses, you wind up with two trips generated for every trip. So be careful. Planners and modelers often say trips are produced at home and attracted to non-home destinations. That is not very helpful for clear thinking. Remember, tours are sequences of trips, which are sequences of stages. 2.2, the daily schedule. The daily schedule is often dominated by a major out-of-home activity. We begin with figure 2.5, the schedule of a day in the life of a typical worker, Paul. Paul awakes from bed, 7 o'clock, and performs various domestic and personal maintenance activities. He then travels from home to work by bus, 8 to 8.20, arriving a few minutes early for work. He spends 10 minutes in the smoker's lounge, at least until it's prohibited. If he avoids falling into a dream at work, he executes various tasks, meets and socializes with colleagues, takes lunch, and resumes work until the close of business. Paul returns home from 5 to 5.30. Sometimes the homework-home orbit of trips has appended other activities, shopping, errands, meal-taking, providing transport for others, and so on. For children, the pattern is mimicked in a homeschool-home cycle. For the retired, some recreation or avocation activities may substitute for work, a vocation. The weekday is dominated by these three activities, time at home, time at work or school or avocation, and time and travel between the two. This pattern is repeated, but differentiated, daily, for the better part of one's life. Two point three, coordination. We can be spatially coordinated to reduce our scheduling cost, or we can be temporally coordinated so that we have lower space costs. The classic multi-purpose room in 1960s era elementary schools, hot desking, or shared parking between office, stadia, retail, and churches, are examples of temporal coordination to share a scarce resource by using it at different times, thereby reducing land and structure costs. Most temporal coordination, though, aims for people to engage in the same task at the same time, and thus consume more space. Cities provide both spatial and temporal coordination, putting people close together and having them do the same things at the same time. Cities work to reduce temporal coordination costs. This is one of the many ways they enhance economies of agglomeration, but they do so by increasing spatial coordination costs. Two people cannot occupy the exact same latitude and longitude at the same time without going vertical. This adds to the cost of construction. We do not have freedom to use our land in any way we want. We must share some rights to it because society demands it. This diminishes our freedom of action. One expects that improved information and communication technologies will reduce the need for in-person interaction, and we certainly see some of that. But reducing the call of the city does not eliminate it. So long as some physical interaction is required, city-like places will emerge. The need for young men and young women of different genetic lines to somehow interact in person is one such call upon the pattern of the city. 200 years ago, the city was barely what it is today. 200 years from now, the city may differ again. While unlikely, cities may return to being seasonal, like the classic medieval trade fair or the vacation community. These once comprised entirely temporary structures, which gradually became permanent. Look at your local fairgrounds for examples of the temporary becoming permanent. Today, we construct state fairs with permanent buildings, figure 2.6. In contrast, world's fairs, which do not repeat annually, have temporary structures. While not made of paper mache, the buildings of Chicago's 1893 White City or even New York's 1963 World's Fair are largely gone, while the World's Fair is a lot less significant than it once was. If people were ever to lose their need for daily physical interaction, which is again highly unlikely, we would expect a thinning of the urban support system less reliance on costly permanent infrastructure, and more reliance on the ad hoc. Humans will still require shelter, and those shelters may still cluster, so long as transport still has costs. Yet we can imagine a world where advanced technology means we don't need to commute or shop more than weekly. And that could also mean we don't need to live as close together. And with advanced driverless cars, even that burden, the need to focus on the task of driving, is lifted, enabling even more spread. 2.4 diurnal curve. 
We sometimes think of the city as a collection of people and objects in space that exist for the purpose of reducing the cost of human interaction. The city is also a collection of activities and time. Taking the long view, cities once did not exist, the time before the founding of the city, and eventually may not exist again. The list of abandoned cities is long, and though this may sadden us, will undoubtedly grow longer. However, the city also operates at shorter time frames. There is the multi-decade cycle of infrastructure renewal and replacement. There is the multi-year, though somewhat random cycle of sports team victories. There is the annual cycle of the city operating through the seasons, with winter and spring and summer and fall events. There is the daily cycle of flows of people into and out of the city. People possess circadian rhythms. They operate on a 24-hour cycle, and about half that time is daylight. Going to the place where that activity, work, school, other, occurs follows a pattern. Leave home early enough to arrive at the destination at a desired time. Do something there. Leave after, say, eight hours, and return home. There are many complexities. Figure 2.7 from Transport for London has two peaks, morning and evening. These peaks are the rush hours of common complaint, when more people want to use the transport system than capacity is immediately available, leading to congestion. This graph shows both the supply provided by the public transport system, more seats are made available during the peak, and the demand of users. Supply clearly responds to the demands. The afternoon or evening peak is usually higher, and almost always broader, than the morning peak, as we organize more activities after work than before. Why do we see diurnal patterns of flow? Why are there morning and afternoon peaks, or what we refer to as rush hours? The answer is to ensure some set of people, peak commuters, are generally in the same place at the same time. We do this to reduce interpersonal coordination costs. If we're generally in the same place, we don't need to prearrange meetings. We run into each other in the hallways. I can easily knock on your door and I see you on the sidewalk. Our temporal coordination costs drop. And even if we do not need to prearrange, it is relatively simple. An instructor might tell the students in class, I am here because you are here. You are here because I am here. In contrast, if we are not generally in the same place, we do not need to prearrange meetings, and I will not randomly run into you. Our temporal coordination costs rise. In the U.S., most trips are not commuting trips, even during rush hour. However, work trips with their tight scheduling overload the system at peak hours. There are lots of people for whom the congestion costs of the peak outweigh benefits of organizing work on the standard schedule. Many people with shifts in organizations that operate more than eight hours a day including medical, police and fire, manufacturing, transport, retail, some construction, and media, travel in the off-peak. For some, this is necessary. You don't want to change bus drivers in the middle of the peak. For others, convenience. Why travel at rush hour when it is unnecessary? In the United States Central Time Zone, that peaking pattern is partially dictated by what happens on the East Coast. People using Central Time tend to go to work earlier than they otherwise would to ensure greater overlap in time at work with those back East. Similarly, People involved in international trade may keep odd hours locally to coordinate with their customers or clients elsewhere in the world. In other parts of the world, schedules similarly adapt to the needs of trade as well as local custom. In some places, work lasts until very late, but there are midday breaks. This temporal coordination imposes the cost of increased loads on the transport system as people converge and diverge at the same time requiring either more capacity or causing crowding and slower speeds. We can and do smooth the flows on transport systems, encouraging peak spreading, some of which the market does by itself, through differentiated prices. Accessibility varies by time of day. When travel by car is slower in the peak hours due to congestion, accessibility drops with it. When travel by transit is faster because of higher frequency of service, accessibility rises. It not only varies by hour, it varies minute to minute. The accessibility by transit is much higher a minute before the bus departs than the second after. Planners typically assume that opportunities are available 24 hours a day. This, of course, is not true. Many jobs expect you to be on site during certain time periods and arrive at a certain time. Schools and stores are open during certain hours. For instance, there is no access to eating out when restaurants are closed. We make this assumption because of lack of data the hours of operation and may not need to in the future, and we can truly map. 24-hour sitting. 2.5 Travel Time One of the most infamous claims made about travel behavior is that the time spent on it is constant over the years. This claim is generally made for whole populations, not individuals, where personal introspection and observation tells us that the time spent changes with age, family responsibilities, 
as well as new workplaces or homes. It is a claim made for regular daily travel happening in the usual environment of the traveler. Figure 2.8 from the UK depicts an example. There are at least three budgets we can consider. The day has 1,440 minutes. This is fixed, and all of the time within the day must be allocated to activities or travel. There is the total amount of time spent traveling daily for all purposes, and there is the total amount of time spent commuting, or travel to and from work. Jakob Zahavi and all those in his tradition based the claim of daily travel time budgets on a striking similarity of the reported numbers for total daily travel time in local, regional, and national travel diary surveys. A figure of 60 minutes was proposed, but this has crept up over the years, as about 100 minutes of travel are reported in Switzerland, for example. The claim is powerful when linked to Down's law of peak hour expressway congestion or triple convergence, or more formally, induced demand which observes that travelers will respond to changes in the transport system by changing their behavior until they cannot find a way to improve their situation further. These changes can be caused by travelers improving their daily schedule by leaving or arriving earlier, by them changing to a more attractive mode, by them switching the workplace or residential location for something better, or by them doing more things outside the home, meeting friends, attending civic meetings, or watching a child's soccer game. An investment in transport will first generate travel time savings and thus accessibility. But in the longer term, these savings are lost as the increased speed leads to increased distance traveled by car. You may say the investment was in vain, and when you look only at time use or motorway speeds, you can essentially make the political argument that all such investment is pointless. Or you can look to see whether these long-term changes are indicators that more people can now use the new capacity to do things they want to do, when, where, and how they want to do them. Next to political assessment is the empirical question, is all of the change converted into longer travel? If taken seriously, the constant travel time budget implies an elasticity of minus one in terms of travel distance with respect to changes in travel time. Only then can the budget stay constant. There is some work on this, but not as much as the size of the claim would justify. So some of the gains remain in the transport system, mostly as better daily schedules for travelers. On the one hand, capacity additions can improve conditions for travelers who can take advantage of them, even after considering changes to travel patterns. On the other, rising population increases travel demand and congestion. And in some places, population is increased faster than capacity. These offsetting factors help explain the relative stability of daily travel time budgets. There's a third hand, though. Travelers may have preferences for a certain amount of travel. They may not want to live too near the workplace and desire some spatial separation. This is called a positive utility of commute. Rational locators may also recoil at commutes that, over time, become too long. In other words, a commute that was 25 minutes when they moved in has now eroded to 35 minutes due to rising congestion from increased population. Rational locators will periodically readjust their home and or work location to keep this from getting out of hand. For instance, moving to a new location that is, again, only 25 minutes from work or taking a job near a home, which may be longer in terms of distance as suburban routes and urban routes have different speeds. 2.6 Travel Time Distribution When we combine opportunity expansion with distance decay, we get the travel time distribution. The more opportunities in a location, the more likely it will be chosen. The farther away some place is, the less likely it will be chosen. These are offsetting. It leads to distributions that look like figure 2.9, which was drawn from the travel behavior inventory for the Twin Cities for commute trips by automobile. In the places near home, at the left of the plot, it leads to an increasing willingness to make a longer duration trip. In places farther from the origin, at the right, it leads to decreasing willingness as the additional opportunities fail to outweigh the longer durations. 2.7 Social Interactions Leisure is the largest and fastest growing segment of the travel market in advanced societies. In the industrialized world, leisure travel makes up about 40% of all trips and 40% of all distance traveled. Leisure is a catch-all category in standard travel diary surveys, not work, not education, not shopping, not personal business, and not picking up or dropping somebody off. It covers many different activities, from window shopping to meeting friends for a weekend hike. Some of these leisure activities are regular such as attendance at church or going to the gym, but others are irregular or unique. 
that visit to a friend last seen 10 years ago, or going on the Hajj. These activities don't have the same constraints as work or school, to which we are committed through a contract or a legal requirement. Some are spontaneous, but others express deeply held commitments, such as pilgrimage or even a trip to the gym. While we often think of them as discretionary, their social nature makes them location binding for us. 80 to 90 percent of these activities involve other people, family, friends, the three other golfers, other players of the team, the other nine worshippers waiting for you to make a minion, quorum, in the synagogue, never mind the dog expecting your walk. This overwhelming social nature of leisure implies that the activities are also joint decisions, as one has to account for others when setting dates and locations. In some cases, the choices have become so habitual that the organizer does not think any more, say for clubs, civic, or religious events. But for most others, the negotiation is a large part of the preparations, which can be seen in the large amount of text message, social network, email, and telephone traffic involved beforehand. As the effort involved in participating face-to-face in an event, meeting, party, or get-together involves, at a minimum, the travel to get to its place, the spatial distribution of friends becomes crucial. The wider our circles, the more travel and associated greenhouse gases we will produce. Yes, the higher the effort, the less likely that we will meet certain persons. But there will be a certain minimum frequency to honor our links. Attendance at the wedding of a cousin, being at the funeral of your friend's wife, or the annual joint hike. While sociologists have long studied the structure of social networks, they gave little and generally cursory attention to the spatial distribution of such networks. Recent work by joint teams of transport planners and social scientists has shed light on the distances involved, such as figure 2.10. In this typical example from a Swiss study, the bulk of social context lives within a 30-minute car ride, supporting the idea of a 30-minute threshold in a typical accessibility analysis. But there's a substantial share living much farther away, including overseas. This distribution should add more long-distance context as travel and communication become cheaper, with low-cost flying and effectively free video conferencing. So indeed, the home addresses of our friends and our wish to meet them is one driver in travel and greenhouse gas production. 2.8. Activity space. The activity space represents the places that a person or household engages or occupies in a given period of time, typically a day. An illustrative activity space for one traveler is shown in figure 2.11. The potential activity space, on the other hand, represents the maximal area over which the traveler could engage in activities. The activity space is only a small part of all places an individual has knowledge about and could go, which was referred to as the action space. The extent of the activity space depends on the individual, their preferences, the opportunities available both within and outside the space, and the character of the network in that space. Areas with high accessibility, where more destinations can be reached in less time, have smaller activity spaces because people can accomplish their daily wants and needs closer to home. Households with more cars, more income, and more workers have larger spaces, as mobility increases the viability of farther away destinations. Activity space examines the actual travel of an individual or family. Accessibility considers the potential. 2.9 Space-Time Prism The daily schedule is a complex optimization problem. You might think of your schedule as what shows up on your calendar or daily planner, but there are many activities you probably don't typically record, driving to work, going out to lunch, sleeping, and so on. To engineers and mathematicians, the daily schedule is a complex optimization problem filled with objectives and constraints. There are periods of time, windows, when you have to be at a certain place in order to be available to others. You have to be able to get to these points with the mobility tools you can bring along and you want to spend certain amounts of time at each point to be able to achieve your goals. All of this within the 24 hours of the day and within your commitments and monetary budgets. So how do people solve this daily problem? Often we start with what happened yesterday, or last week on the same day, as a model. We also have many previous occasions of when we wanted to combine certain activities at the same location. We have building blocks, which reduce the complexity of the problem enormously. In addition, there are constraints that make many combinations of places infeasible within the allotted time. Social scientists have thought about this problem for a long time. The diagrams in the figure above are from Torsten Hagerstrand, a famous Swedish geographer who identified and visualized one set of these constraints in the 1970s. His insight was to see that some activities in time and space are much more firmly committed to than others. Think of the work schedule of a nurse or teacher, or the need to drop a child off at school. These firm commitments form anchors within the daily schedule. 
constraining the time available for remaining activities and where they might take place. We are all caught in time and space. The space-time prism explains why motorized modes are so attractive. First streetcars in the late 1800s, then automobiles in the early 1900s, increased the domain that travelers could reach between their committed activities compared with walking. In theory, that increase translates into more satisfaction with the activities undertaken. It also makes clear why pedestrians like very dense environments, as there they can reach many alternatives on foot, while mass transit and cars, especially, slow with congestion. This reach is especially important as people generally plan with firm commitments only a part of their day and leave the rest available for spontaneously arising opportunities and ideas. It also makes clear why an overly committed schedule is so stressful as it robs people of the chance to act spontaneously. It requires care to avoid disturbing the clockwork of interweaving moments and activities. As in the figure, the traveler can leave the first commitment at the speed of the mobility at hand, a bicycle, a public transport season ticket, or a car. Generally, the traveler has to leave for the second commitment with the same mobility tool and at the same speed. These two funnels define that part of space-time available for an activity or set of activities. You have an isochrone about you at any given time, defining where you can go, given constraints. 2.10 Choice I came to a fork in the road, right or left to what abode, a chance step along the way, what would be, who can say? So toss a coin, let it fall, as good a way as any at all. Locators choose where to live and work. Travelers choose what to do, where to go, when to leave, and how to get there. Since the 1970s, analysts have converged on a family of models called qualitative choice models to better understand this process. Unlike typical regression models, the outcome of choice models is a probability of making a choice like the probability of choosing transit versus driving versus walking for a trip to work. This choice depends on the utility of the choice maker. The probability depends on how much benefit each alternative provides relative to the alternatives. That it is probabilistic rather than deterministic, the choice maker just picks the best or highest utility alternative, is because there is uncertainty along the way about the measurement of the inputs, about how the choice maker perceives the inputs, and about how well the analyst measures the choice maker's preferences. The most widely used choice model in transport is called the Logit model, a particular version of which was formalized by Daniel McFadden in the 1960s and 70s, and for which he was awarded a Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000, based on work he did to model the mode choice of travelers in the San Francisco Bay Area back in the 1970s. 2.11 Principle of Least Effort The principle of least effort maintains that people try to minimize their energy when engaging in an activity. In concept, the principle of least effort is thus analogous to the principle of least action in physics. For instance, people may use the shortest path between an origin and destination. This assumption is embedded in more or less literal form in most routing models. In fact, as in Figure 2.14, we observe that people don't use the shortest travel time path for a variety of reasons, among them time perception, knowledge of the network, computational burden, search costs, making decisions emotionally rather than rationally, and caring about factors beyond travel time like reliability, the travel time of others, or weighting different elements of travel time, like stops, more than other elements of travel time, like moving at free flow speed, which again leads to different behaviors. Still, as a general idea, people will tend to choose the nearest satisfactory destination, the mode requiring the least time, cost, and inconvenience, and likewise a route, and certainly don't do the opposite. Cities exist to maximize access, the number of places that can be reached in the least time, cost, effort, subject to individual preferences. By making things convenient, people can do more with less. Less time is spent traveling to reach specialized workplaces, vendors, customers, shops, churches, family, and others. While certainly cities grow to the point that congestion becomes a headache, they still produce far more access than the alternative, people spreading themselves out to maximize the space between them. 2.12 Capability the ability to undertake activities depends on the ability to access the environments where those activities take place. People who are limited in their ability to access are termed transport disadvantage. They may be disadvantaged for any number of reasons, including, for instance, physical or mental disability of some kind, inability to speak the common language, inability to drive because of youth or slow reaction times, or lack of resources to possess a private vehicle. Disadvantage thus is broader than a measure of disability that counts defects or impairments with an individual. And instead, 
focuses on barriers people face when interacting with the environment. It should be noted that while the most visible disabilities, like being in a wheelchair, attract a lot of attention, both socially and politically, and are allocated parking spaces, as in Figure 2.15, there are many invisible disabilities as well. People with disabilities are a large and growing population whose needs must be considered for designs and plans to be successful. About one in five Americans has some kind of disability, and one in ten has a severe disability. The number of people aged older than 65 is also steadily increasing. Because the population is aging and the likelihood of having a disability increases with age, the growth in the number of people with disabilities can be expected to accelerate in the coming decades. People with disabilities face more challenges interacting with the built environment than those without. Disability is a complex phenomenon involving interaction between features of the person and features of the overall context in which the person lives. The social model of disability shifts the concept of disability from counting or categorizing defects or impairment within an individual to a focus on barriers people face within the environment. The social model argues that activity limitations are not caused by the impairment, but rather by social institutions. For example, a person with a vision impairment that prevents driving a car will likely rely heavily on public transit. If there is no accessible transit, this can limit participation in the community and the ability to live independently, shrinking the space-time prism. Reliance on other modes, like paratransit or taxis, can become prohibitively expensive. Hence, increasing access to services and facilities in the environment is an important aspect of ensuring full participation of people with disabilities in their communities and, in turn, improving their health and wellness. Studies linking health in the built environment have concluded that the design choices we make in our homes, schools, workplaces, communities, and transport systems impact health. 2.13 Observation Paradox People consistently overestimate the crowdedness of transport facilities like roads, buses, and trains. There's a logical reason for this overestimation, which we call the observation paradox. Imagine there are two buses. One carries 49 people, the other carries one person. The average number of people on each bus, what the field calls the load factor, is 25, 49 plus 1 divided by 2. There are, however, 49 people who think there are 49 people aboard, and one who thinks one is aboard. If you compute the perceived load factor, 49 times 49 plus 1 times 1 divided by 50, you get 48. So instead of an actual average load of 25, people perceive an average of 48 people on board. The same is true of roads. More people perceive roads to be congested because they themselves are in congestion, or as we might say, because the people are congestion. It's even worse since speeds under congested travel conditions are slower, and if you weight travel by the number of minutes experienced rather than by distance, congestion appears worse. All of which is to say that anecdotal evidence is not a reliable measure of congestion or transit use, but objective measures will not align with individual experience. This creates policy and political problems and can lead to misinvestment. 2.14 Capacity is Relative Capacity in the transport world is typically considered a relatively fixed element. Capacity, however, is a relative term, much more so than we give it credit for. Figure 8.11 comes from a light rail train in St. Paul, especially crowded as it was opening day. For those familiar with transit in most U.S. cities, this train is relatively full. Figure 2.17 comes from Tokyo, where uniformed attendants routinely cram commuters onto a busy train while future passengers stand and look forward to the same mistreatment. To those from Japan, the St. Paul train is essentially empty. To those from the United States, the Japanese train is insanity. Capacity has less to do with physical amount of space in the train than what we are willing to tolerate in terms of personal space and comfort. The same can be said for level of service, LOS, which is a metric based primarily upon driver's comfort. Level of service A is not better than level of service D from any perspective other than those driving. If every road in your city operates at level of service A, B, C, or even D, then your city is likely lacking economically and in terms of overall vitality. Moreover, few things help other modes become competitive more than level of service values of E or F. And as discussed in the section on flux, bikes are far narrower than cars, SUVs, and trucks. Thus, a seemingly full road might have a lot more capacity, even before automated vehicles, than we currently see possible. 2.15. Time Perception Time flies when you are having fun. It crawls when you are not. 
Time perception and the quality of the experience, it should be no surprise, depends on the environment in which that experience occurs. Sometimes people think places are farther away than they really are, and other times they think they are closer. Freeways seem to take less time than they really do, local streets longer. This, in part, has to do with task complexity, or the mental transaction costs involved in traveling. When making many small driving and navigation decisions, like on a signalized route with lots of turns, the driver focuses on the driving task more often. Each time, the driver engages her conscious brain in traveling decisions, and more brain space is occupied by traveling thoughts. Other factors include temporal relevance. Is the trip important? Temporal expectancies. What does the driver think the travel time will be? Temporal uncertainty. How reliable is the estimate of travel time? Affective elements. What is the emotional state of the traveler? Absorption and attentional deployment. Is the driver paying attention to the task at hand? And arousal. How physically activated is the driver? Is she on drugs? When driving on an uncongested freeway, many drivers avoid such thoughts. Driving is less salient. Time passes faster. Vera Ort's law also claims people are more likely to overestimate short times and underestimate long times. However, we did not corroborate this with a driving simulator study illustrated in figure 2.18 for waiting at your traffic signal. Perceived and actual waiting time were virtually identical for the first 30 seconds, but for times greater than 30 seconds, actual waiting times were higher than perceived waiting times, up to 120 seconds. At 120 seconds, the trend was for perceived time to overtake actual time, but that was the cutoff for the experiment, so perception findings in this situation require more information. However, the annoyance level at 120 seconds of waiting was much higher than the annoyance of waiting 30 seconds. Further, people hated stops. Of course, with all of this, it depends on how the question is framed, what is asked, and what travelers were expecting. For instance, comparing a computer-administered survey that asked about time preferences, in this case comparing a mix of stop-and-go traffic with time waiting at a ramp meter, with one in which travelers were in a driving simulator completely flipped preferences for traveling, waiting for free-flow travel versus muddling through congestion. Time perception may be even more important for transit use. Real-time bus or train arrival information helps reduce the anxiety of uncertainty associated with waiting for transit. But more basic experience is important. People overestimate wait times in general. They overestimate it more when there are no amenities like benches and shelters, and less when there are. When the environment is polluted and near high traffic roads, time is overestimated more. Women in particular overestimate weights in what are perceived as unsafe or insecure surroundings. The presence of trees reduces the travel time estimate. The relevant time for individuals assessing their own accessibility is the perceived time. This differs from the objectively measured time used by the analyst. 2.16 Time, Space, and Happiness We spend time to afford more space. We commute farther to get more land. But the more time we spend traveling to a remote land, the less time we have to appreciate it. If we work 8 hours per day, sleep 8 hours per day, the maximum daily commute would be 4 hours each way. In that extreme case, we'd be driving 4 hours for a bed and have no time to appreciate it, ignoring holidays and weekends. Thus, where we lived would only matter for days without work, aside from other family issues. If we worked at home, we would have zero minutes of commute with eight hours to enjoy our home and neighborhood. Where we lived would be very important. This too is complicated by other family members, work, school, etc. People generally choose under a 30-minute commute each way, which theoretically leaves seven hours a day to do other things. This includes both appreciating the neighborhood environment and the physical structure itself. Consider a hypothetical daily travel time budget. Consider a hypothetical daily time budget, which is largely locationally independent. Eight hours sleeping, eight hours working, one and a half hours traveling, say for a worker, 60 minutes commuting and 30 minutes other travel, one hour at other out-of-home activities, three hours in front of a screen at home, two and a half maximum number of hours to enjoy your location. So every one minute less spent traveling is one minute more at the margin to enjoy your location. If an extra minute spent traveling, not from 90 to 91 minutes, say, reduces time available to enjoy the place from 150 to 149 minutes, we ask if those 149 minutes at the newer place are 0.67% better than the 150 minutes at the older place. Maybe they are. Spending 30 minutes more travel, 15 minutes each way, reduces time available from 150 to 120 minutes. Now we have to ask if the minutes at the new location spent are 20% better. It is hard to expect to be 20% happier or 20% more likely that you will be happy from physical surroundings when so much of your life will be similar. 
The data on happiness are complicated. Individuals rarely quantify it or think about it in these terms. But research finds that people in small towns near big cities are about 10% happier than people in cities. That does not compare directly with our 20% since it encompasses the happiness of the whole day, not just the marginal time. But even if commuting is the least pleasant thing people do, a little bit might be worth it. An elementary school science fair project asked kids two questions. How happy they were, based on a Likert scale of five happy to sad face cartoon pictures, and then what mode of transport they took to school. The results showed that kids who walked or biked were significantly happier than those who were driven or rode the bus. See figure 2.20. 2.17, risk compensation. Reducing risk encourages risk taking. Quote, kids should always wear a helmet when they're bicycling, end quote. It is hard to question that statement. And in many places, it is the law, even in a few places without mandatory motorcycle helmet laws. A funny thing happens when riders wear a helmet, they ride faster and more recklessly, and cars drive more closely. Why? The helmet makes the riders feel safer, and the risk of getting hurt or hurting someone for the driver subconsciously fades away. Thus, they behave differently. Changing one's behavior due to a change in perceived safety risk is called risk compensation. But who is really safer, a reckless rider with a helmet or a careful rider without one? Risk compensation is ubiquitous. You see it in sports like American football and hockey, where additional protective equipment facilitates bigger hits. You also see it in race car driving, a notoriously dangerous sport, so much so that the sport has gone to great lengths to improve safety with better helmets, seatbelts, roll cages, fire retardant uniforms, and soft wall technology. All of these efforts have reduced the chance of a fatality when a crash occurs, yet the research shows that as the casualty rate per crash drops, the number of crashes increases. Drivers can push the limits of their race car to an even greater extent because they feel safer knowing that the risk of death or severe injury is relatively low. In terms of road safety, for the rest of us, the outcomes are not all that different. For most of the last 50 years, the conventional approach to improving safety focused on vehicle improvements, such as seat belts, airbags, and crumple zones, and road designs that were wide and straighter with increased sight distances and clear zones. This safety paradigm emanated from the U.S. Congressional Road Safety Hearings of the 1960s. The new mindset focused on engineering measures, such as better vehicle and street designs, that were far easier to influence than the behavior of millions of drivers. While some of these efforts did in fact improve road safety, this was not always the case. Many of the so-called safer road designs, for instance, did not fulfill their promise. If behaviors remained constant, the underlying theory would have been successful. Unfortunately, a driver feeling safe on the road can profoundly impact behavior. Whether the driver is more likely to speed, divert their attention from the road by taking on the phone, or listening to music, or even fall asleep at the wheel, the research suggests that many such road safety improvements actually decreased overall safety. The problem is risk compensation. It's the same reason you now rely on your vehicle's backup camera instead of looking over your shoulder and using the camera to enhance the information you used to gather manually. For transport engineers and planners, the line between safe and unsafe is not always clear. To have a better chance for clarity, we need to better account for risk compensation and the impact of the resulting behavior changes in our designs. The observant reader will note that risk compensation is the same idea as a constant travel time budget, coupled with induced demand. Faster speeds, at least in part, are used to increase distance, not reduce time. Safer travel is used, at least in part, to increase speed, not reduce risk. An increase in speed has knock-on accessibility benefits. People select a driving speed based on their feeling of safety. If they feel safer, they will drive faster and thus have more accessibility via automobile. Similarly, bicyclists choose routes based on a trade-off of safety and speed. The safer they feel, the faster their trip, and more accessibility via bicycle results.